So we are starting a new sermon series this week, a new eight-part series, Breaking Free. We're looking at the book of Exodus as we look through this series of these eight weeks. And we basically said that, you know, there are many things that the people at the time in Exodus were bound in slavery to the Egyptians, the nation of Israel, and they were looking to break free. And that's really the essence of what was happening in that old story. But it's moments here that as we look at this over these next eight parts that we learn to break free from the bondage that many of us find ourselves in captivity now, in the captivity of various sins. So, oh, so you can take a story that's from the Old Testament, and so many people say, oh, we don't have to look at that. Oh, yes, we do. Because there are such good stories that are contained there that speak to the very essence of who we are as Christians and how hopefully as we look through this Old Testament book from this Exodus, how we ourselves can break free from the bondage of whatever sin you may find yourself in today. So the series purpose, as we look over these next eight weeks, is a study of this book of Exodus to break free from the bondage of whatever sin that you may be held in captivity today. Well, let's understand something when we talk about freedom, because it's important, I think, as Christians, too, to understand about the freedom that has been granted to all of us. William Barclay, the the theologian, said this, look, Christian freedom does not mean being free to do as we like, and and that may fall into our lives sometimes, but rather means being free to do as we ought. What does that basically mean? Meaning that if God has set us free, then it's so important to tell others about his greatness, about how great he is in changing and developing and and moving in our lives in powerful ways. Meaning we're free to share that love and that message to other people. Well, the book of Exodus, I've already said, is this Old Testament book. And it's really just the second book of of the Old Testament. It's, It's Genesis, then Exodus. So it's the second book in the Bible. It's part of the Torah, or the first five books of the Bible. Maybe you've heard of it as the Pentateuch, those first five books. And by the way, those books would have been used, and Jesus would have heard them. This language that we see from the book of Exodus would have been teachings that Jesus would have heard about when he was young as well. So yeah, it's worth teaching from in our lives as well. And really, when you think about it, the Exodus is really just a continuation of of God's purpose or story through his chosen people. Oh, it launched in Genesis when he came to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And we continue on with this story because we know Jacob had these 12 sons, which, by the way, gives us the names of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. But we learn of that story. We're kind of picking things up today when recognizing that the one son of Jacob, Joseph, was was exiled. We did this sermon series on him not too long ago. But he was cast off by his brothers and ended up in Egypt. And there he found himself rising eventually, after many years, into a position of power. Second in power among the whole nation. And then during a great famine that occurred. That that Joseph was able, through God, provide for the nation of Egypt. But his family who was away comes down. And it was about 70 of them show up there in Egypt. And we kind of pick up our story there today. And it's really when you think about this story in the second book of the Bible, Exodus, many times people think of the word Exodus. Oh, it was a great Exodus. It means it was great leaving or getting out. But did you know, in the Hebrew, the name Exodus, Shemoth, is really means names. And where does that come from? Well, the very opening of the book of Exodus says, these are the names. That's how verse 1 starts out. And that's where Exodus actually comes from. It's a name of a book. So when we think too often about Exodus, we think about leaving, when in reality it simply means names. And you'll see how the power of names works into this series or the beginning of our message today. Now, the story begins as we open up the book of Exodus, or names, with a baby boom. Meaning there's this great explosion in the population of the nation of Israel. But here's the thing. It was less than booming times. For those people. Meaning you have this population explosion as a backdrop of oppression and slavery. A difficult time period. But speaking of names, naming your baby. Right? Think about how we go about picking names for baby. Dr. Scott, you're here actually. You're about ready to have a baby. And one of the things you're going to have to do is name that child. Because you don't want to go through life without having a name for your child. Am I right? And you think about the different ways in which we choose names. Maybe it's, it's pop culture too you know and a a popular singer might be a lot of girls named taylor coming up here pretty soon because of taylor swift you know but their cultural things will will bleed into famous people will take on basically a name 
Or maybe it's a religion. That's where I get my name from. You know, the, from Mark. I'm named after the Gospel of Mark is one of those privileges that I have to actually share that. But my middle name is also from family tradition. My middle name is Allen. That was my grandfather's name. So Mark Allen. I have a mix of not only my religious heritage, but also my family tradition. Maybe your names also have those middle name or some other name that stands back into family history. My twin brother, he has the middle name Elwood. Now, he's not now his son's back there today. That's one word that he doesn't like to use. But that was a family name that was given. And some of those names we like to kind of leave back there in history, too. But they sometimes follow with generations as well. But we, there, there is that intention. And maybe it's cultural heritage or location when picking the name of a baby. Well, since the, the book of Exodus means names, we're going to look a little bit closer at names today. So I invite all of you to follow along on the screen. Use your pew Bibles or simply uh, use your smartphones as well talking about in Exodus chapter 1 verses 1 to 20 from the NIV it's a, it's a section entitled it opens up the Israelites oppressed less than a booming time these are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, remember I talked about that Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, each with his family and here comes the names Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah Issachar, Zebulon and Benjamin Dan and Naphtali Gad and Asher the descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. That's what started out. Joseph was already in Egypt. That was the brother that was there we talked about that rose into a place of prominence to help the people during a difficult time. Now in verse 6, now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. So we're moving along here in the story. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly. That's that baby boom. Increased in numbers and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing. Let's pause there for a second. Let's think about that. Isn't that something? There you have Joseph who rose the second in all of command, a great famine over the land, which meant, would have meant the destruction of Egypt. But this man, Joseph, rises and finds by God's power and his divine path, shows them how to survive. And they do that. Seven years of plenty, followed by the seven years of famine. It's through Joseph. He, he saves that nation. But here we go. After they're all dead, what happens? The new king, he, Joseph meant nothing. Isn't that something about our history? We just celebrated June 6th the celebration of D-Day, right? Normandy invasion. And watching the few veterans that still that are alive are over 100 years old. How is it possible that soon before we know, we won't remember anything about it? But here we have a situation where the past history was not remembered any longer. And the name Joseph meant nothing. Well, that's the person, this new king, came to power in Egypt. Then he says in verse 9, Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And then look at this thought process. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies. Why? Why would he think that? Isn't that interesting? A skewed vision of, of what history was all about, and he simply says that, you know, if war breaks out, they're going to join our enemies. Why not? Why would they not fight with them? But instead, he believes they'll fight with their enemies. And they'll fight against us and leave the country. So here's what he did. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. That's that difficult time. And they built Pithom and, and Ramesses and store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So you hear what we were saying about a baby boom was happening, even though... It was not booming times for them. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made them their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. And all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names, there's a names things, were Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. What? But if it's a girl, let her live. 
This is where you're, it's better to be a girl than a boy. But think about that. Think about what's happening here. Not, not only do we have this oppressive you know, burden on the Israel nation, now it's about killing and murder of the children. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased, there again, population boom, and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Now, now I give that whole first chapter, and we're done through chapter one already, and we're looking at chapter two today as well. Do you see the backdrop of how difficult this is? This is where we're about to see the name Moses come onto the scene, the birth of, of Moses. But understand that the backdrop to which Moses is born into is a very difficult time, very traumatic. I mean, think about that. The, the, the people he's being born into are slaves, and greatly oppressed, hardly work. And, and, and if you look at some of the studies of, of, of this Exodus type series and you see some of the words in here, it, it kind of goes off in the deeper level. It said the people were almost done with God. They, they just couldn't take it anymore. They were beat down so low, so oppressed and so hurt. There's all this trauma that happens. And then, you know, the babies that are born, oh, if it's a male, put it to death. Could you imagine that? You wouldn't think during a population explosion, when we think about baby boomers, we think of good, prosperous time. But this population is growing in the midst of great oppression and trauma. Which leads me to today's message title, Freedom from Early Life Trauma. Now, i got to tell you, to be completely full disclosure, when the Lord kind of gave me as to kind of how to do this, this chapter and these two chapters, I was like, nah, Lord, this is a little difficult. This is a little hard, and this may require us to go to places that we don't want to go to. But then the Lord said, oh, but you got to, Mark. You got to share what you've kind of been said or been told to you. So we're going to look at this, this trauma that happens, what Moses is born into. So Exodus chapter 2, the birth of Moses, that's the backdrop for it. So in this second chapter, now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. Interesting enough, the parents are not given their names here. Odd, isn't it? And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. So the first three months of Moses' life is not going around baby showers and going to see people. It's in hiding. That's how he began his life. But when she could hide him no longer... She got a piper's basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. The only time it's kind of mentioned like that in Genesis when it talks about the ark. So she makes this little ark, this little basket, and puts it, and places the child in it, and puts it among the reeds along the, the bank of the Nile. Meaning what? She's putting him out into the river, out into the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. What was the law? What was the rule? Every boy should be cast where? Into the Nile. So she does that very thing. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. Oh, this is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. So what should the Pharaoh's daughter do? Kill the baby? It's where God's hand is a part of all this. And his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. Look at this. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Oh, you, that's God. I mean, honestly, if you don't see that, I mean, come on. Of all the Hebrew women, she picks who? You know, Moses' mother. Wow. So Pharaoh's daughter and said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. They're, they're, isn't that crazy then, too? Have a baby, have to give it up, get it back. Oh, and then we're going to pay you to take care of it. I, 
I kind of like that deal. Because when you have children, all you ever seem to do is pay for them. But she's taking care of the child, and she's getting paid to do it. Well, that, that's God. <laughs> I mean, I look at that and think, boy, that, that, that's all it can be. Now, when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him. There's the naming. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Now, let's just stop there for a minute. Consider the trauma here going on. Moses' birth occurred, as we already said, in the height of oppression, fear, and death. This is, this is difficult time. This is how Moses is brought on the scene. But what's in a name when you think about this? The story of God's servant Moses, the name itself in the Hebrew verb, not surprising, meaning to pull out, to draw out of the Nile. That, that's what's happening here. You know, it, she's put off into the, the river to, to go to be killed, but then God rescues and pulls out. Or draws out. Now, now there, there's a message. There's a whole storyline for all of us there if you haven't picked up on that yet. You know, you may, may feel cast off to whatever's going on in your life, but there it is God with being able to pull us out or to draw us out of whatever water you might be floating in today. Now, Egyptologists will actually say the name Moses is another word for son. And so, Tutmos, like some of the, might be the son of Thoth. You might say, like, that there is that tie there, too. So, Egyptologists will say that, but I like the Hebrew meaning on that one about being pulled out of the water. Now, it's interesting. Now, in this particular chapter, we've even focused on names, because what does the book of Exodus mean? To leave. No, 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 names, right? But in the book of, when we talk about in the beginning of this story, we're not even told Moses' parents' name. Now, okay, Bible scholars, this would be one of those things you get in a Bible trivia thing. In Exodus 6, 20, you're actually told Moses' parents' names. And, they, and, and by honest assessment, how many of you knew the parents' name of Moses? Not a single one of us. Isn't that something? So sometimes, I guess a name doesn't matter, right? But in this case, that's the name, his true name of his parents were the ones that were told there. You can look it up at Exodus 6.20, look it up later. But Moses was hidden for three months, kind of kept hidden from all the oppression and difficulty that was going in. Now, in desperation, his mother threw him in the Nile, which is the literal sense of the law. But that's where I said already, God's provision is here. And you'll see this, that in the, the difficulty of the trauma and the oppression and the fear and even all the death that's going on, God provides in this particular situation, and it's Pharaoh's daughter. Isn't that something, too? It could have been so many other people, but who gave the order to kill all the Hebrew boys? Pharaoh. So who's he have pull out of the Nile? His daughter. It's Pharaoh's daughter pulls him out of the Nile. That's God. If you don't see the hand of God in that, you need to look a little closer at the word of God. And then only God, as I've already mentioned, Moses' actual mother is involved in his care and his initial upbringing. I mean, that, that to me is astounding, isn't it? And that's what happens here in this story. You see God's hand working and moving already in the beginning of this story and the life of Moses. Do you see God in any way working in your life? Providing in any way, even in difficult moments, even in, in, in trauma and issues that we have, can God be found in any of it? So here's a question. How long have you been floating in denial? Yes, I know that's spelled wrong. But do you get it? How long have you been floating in denial of past hurts and failures? Because this is the heart of, of the message as I studied this, that God said, this is what needs to be shared, that there are people here floating in denial in the past hurts in their lives, and God is desperate to want to pull you out and provide some way of getting you out of that trouble, but you just want to keep floating, look at this, in denial, and getting to the heart of what's really happening here. And, and this is the thing, this is where this name thing, what's, in, what's Exodus mean? Name. So it's time to give it a name. Whatever has had you trapped, whatever has you bound in, in the denial, whatever past hurt or failure, it, it's time to, to, to take a moment, draw near to it, name it, and then allow God to pull it out of your life. You don't know, when, when I heard these words from God to say, oh no, 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 no. It's much easier for the people to be happy, clappy, and everyone to be happy and walk out of church going, yeah, that was fantastic. But then some days the Lord says, say this to somebody, and it's like, uh-oh. Because it means actually going to those places where we'd rather not go. But I can tell you this, and the Lord usually does this, 
when the Lord gives you something like this, I know there's somebody here right now in denial of past hurts and problems, and they've been covering it up for a long time. And, and, and I'm saying the Lord here today wants you to allow to pull you out of it, to get you rescued for it. And that's what God's all about. This is what he's trying to do through this situation. So, so consider this. What sin or brokenness it throws out to drown us in trauma God is able to pull out of the water to save and restore. Me meaning, to, to bring this stuff up, you may say, well, but I don't want to talk about this now. This is stuff that happened to me when I was very, very young. And let it there. But God's saying, it's time to bring it out and pull it out to save and restore. It's interesting. I've even read a book before about leading out of our dark side. We, we can even take our lives and have something so negative to us that calls us to be extremely successful in life but it's led from our dark side I mean I don't want to ever act like that have you ever said that I don't want to act like my dad or I don't want to act like my mom or how bad it was growing up or whatever trauma I experienced I don't want to live like that and then they'll live in, in such a way but it's really because they've never really addressed it they never allowed God to pull them out of denial and save and restore them in their lives. So look at this. And this is why I say all this. This is what kind of came to me. Moses lives with the trauma for 40 years. And he's raised where? Who, who's he a family member of? Pharaoh. You don't get, it'd be like saying, you, you know, you're now a member of the, the president of the United States. Or you live with them, the most highest powerful. Guess what? People are going to know who you are. So you're going to be famous. You're going to have great wealth. You're going to probably have the best opportunity for education and fame. But here's the thing that's interesting. Raised in those things, and, and yet, and that is the emphasis for so many people, even graduates, you need to hear this today, that, that you may be raised to, to get wealth, get a job where you make the most money, seek the greatest education. Those are good things, yes, and fame, but does it really provide where you may be? Because here's the thing. Such a life, as good as it may be, provides no real healing. And, and if God may be speaking to someone today saying, it's time for you to get out of the denial and be pulled from whatever it is to be saved and restored. Oh, if you give that to God, there's so much more he's able to do with those lives. His, uh, his identity, Moses, you think would be rooted all in, in the nation of Egypt because he's, I mean, right there, he got all the money and fame and education because of the Egyptians. You'd think he would identify with them, but who does he end, end up identifying with? The Israelites, the nation. You don't, you don't believe me? And this is a pondering point as we, as we think about it. This is for myself, too. Why do so many live a life in Egypt or their sin? Massing their identity chosen by God. It's interesting. And we're gonna, as we're going to move into the adulthood of Moses here very quickly, 40 years pass by. As a pastor, you don't think this is, is, is a big thing? So many times in counseling and talking with people, do you know how what holds them back or what people struggle with the most is something that happened to them when they were a child? You don't think that trauma sticks with you and has, and, and, and as I thought about it and said it in the first service, I hadn't thought about it until then, was that, you know, even, even in child abuse situations and, and something as difficult as sexual abuse, how often people who were abused become abusers. It's like they, they don't ever allow it to be addressed or taken care of. And so, therefore, they spend their time living in Egypt, living in the sin, even if they try their best to mask it and hold up. One of the things I love about the, this, the story of Exodus, and I just I love it, is that the people, even when they get out of Egypt and they finally break free, when something difficult comes away, what are they saying? Oh, it was better back in Egypt. It was better back there. And I'll say, can I confess this to you as a pastor today? There are times as a pastor when I go through uh, listening to people and listening to their traumas and, and difficult moments where it's like, man, it was a heck of a lot easier at Hershey being an accountant, sitting there working on numbers and, and dealing with that as opposed to people's problems. And, and I catch myself, man, Pastor Mark, you sound like who? The Israelites. It was better back in Egypt. And so we all can even be guilty of that, even find ourselves drawn into that very trap. And so the purpose in, in this series is to break free from that, allow it to be delivered from it, whatever sin it is, and get us beyond that. 
that are identity that's chosen in God. So let, let's see what happens here. Because this is important in the rest of chapter 2. Moses flees to Midian. How does he get there? Now look, one day, just to see if all this trauma is out of his life. One day, after Moses had grown up, meaning he's got it all figured out now, right? Once you grow up, you have it all figured out. You got it all figured out now? Well, at least you pretend to. You hide your, you know, behind all your success and everything else, and you think you have it all together. So after he had grown up, he went out to where his own people, that's the Israelites were, and watched them at their hard labor. Now he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Look at this next verse in verse 12. Looking this way and that and seeing no one. Right there tells you that Moses knew what he was doing was wrong. You, I, almost every sin that we find ourselves in, you make sure no one else is watching, right? I'm going to dabble in this. I'm going to do this. And so the fact that Moses is looking to his left, looking to his right, making sure no one else is around, tells you one thing, that he knows what he's about to do is wrong. And what does he do? After going looking back and forth in that way, he killed the Egyptian. That's the brokenness of the story that has raised its head once again. Because of maybe knowing about all that happened to him in his childhood, he's pretty irritated with the Egyptians, is he not? And he's so frustrated with them because you'd think if he identified with the Egyptians, he would have been like, yeah, you give it to those people. But instead, he's drawn back and he says, this is wrong. But he takes it to the wrong level, doesn't he? And out of his dark side, instead of God's side, he does what? He kills the man. So don't think for a moment you're doing a great job of hiding your sin. It can come back up, and out of your dark side, you may do something that may be as horrible as this. See, Moses is often never remembered as being a murderer, is he? But he was. That's the beautiful thing about God. Because when we talk about Moses, we, we say him as the leader of the people of the nation of Israel, not that he was a murderer. So God can change this mistake and, and saves him from it. But he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. So then the next day he went out and saw two Hebrews. There's his people fighting. He asking the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? I love this. The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? <laughs> I mean, right there, he's not anybody. But who, who does Moses become? Oh, you know, the ruler and judge over the nation of Israel. But there, you know, he says, who do you think you are? God's working on that in his life, but he's not there yet. Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. His sin is exposed. Now verse, moving on there, we look at this verse. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now, it's for the sake of time, we're jumping to verse 21. Now, Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zephora to Moses in marriage. So now we're, he's, he's passed this, and years have passed. He's now married, and he gives birth to his own son. And here was a naming thing, right? He names his son Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. Now, during that long period, the king of Egypt died. That's how we started off the story, right? That he's gone. But the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. We went through two chapters of the Bible today, and you made it. But here's the pondering point to leave you with today. Do you need to cry out to God for help? Because that's kind of where we see the people near the end of this. They're crying out to God to get the help they need. And just some things with you. If, 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 if any of this has stirred some sort of trauma in your life, uh, past life, especially when you were younger, I, I ask you to consider a couple things. Engage with God in the trauma. I think you've been living in denial long enough, and it's time to work on some of these things. And so one of the things you can do is practice prayer and lamenting, crying out to God for help, to kind of wrestle with it. Lord, is it ready to bring this up? See, I didn't want to preach this 
And some of you are saying, I, good, I can't wait till this is over because I can stop thinking about, you know, living in denial. But I know there's other people here, and, and I know this. Like, you know, when God gives me something like this, so I don't want to hear about it, and that's okay. But I know that there's someone here that really needs to cry out to God. And, and you need to practice that in prayer. Just say, Lord, I've messed up, and things that have happened to me were completely out of my control. Maybe it was abuse as a child. It was completely out of your control. All the things that happened to Moses were what? Completely out of his control. But they happened to him, and trauma was there. And, 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 and to cry, cry out and to pray to the Lord and lament to him. Maybe it's quiet walks with the Lord to know he's near. Lord, I, I'm struggling with this. I need your help. Or maybe it's even journaling. These are some things when, when trauma has occurred to kind of help begin the process. But here's also something else. Engage with God through a Christian counselor. I, as your pastor, I, I, I love hearing from people and talking with them, but I am not a trained professional counselor. And I would encourage there is nothing wrong with getting help with someone and speaking to someone about it. So I want to close with this today. It's a counselor was telling a story. I mean, someone went to a counselor to get some help. And it's the impact of, of crying out to Jesus. You see the words up there. Jesus, save me. Acts chapter 4, verse 14. You know that verse? Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name. What name are we talking about here? Under heaven, given to mankind, by which we must be saved. That's Jesus. So the counselor was telling a story. He said, I had lunch with a friend a couple weeks ago who told me a moving story that underscores the importance of simply crying out to the Lord in times of trouble. He said the friend's mother, as he was telling the story, was a serial marrier. I thought that was cute. Meaning it was a, as a, this guy's mom had many, many relationships and many, many marriages. The mom was also a narcissistic quest for power. When he was young, she was involved in witchcraft, completely out of the boy's control, as means of experiencing more power. The boy did not know his father at all. Did Moses? Didn't know his father at all. And at one point, this little boy threw out all of his to toys because he thought they were talking to him. He thought there was demonic activity in his room. Now, his mom did occasionally go to church, so the boy had some awareness of Jesus. You know, at one point, sometime before the age of eight, eight years old, that's a little boy, was so desperate, he cried out. You know what he cried? Jesus, save me. Now, often we think of that for salvation. And many of you have cried out to God for salvation. But there's more to this here. He believed that he not only was he became a good Christian, and he did that, but the Lord took that cry for help and did so much more. At the age of eight, his mom took him to a particular church down the street just one time to do what? To impress his, her, her boyfriend. That's why he we went. It wasn't to help the child in any way, but she went there to impress the boyfriend, maybe one of the guys she was hoping to marry. And she never went back. But he, the little boy, continued to go. After a while, a lady in the church noticed that he was always there by himself and took him under her wing, picking him up for events, making sure he got to Sunday school, paying for him to go to camp and more. You, you don't think having a children's ministry is important? Hearing this story just blows the doors right off of that. But this woman reached out to this child and started to invest in this child. The boy said three words, Jesus, save me. And there was this mom helping out. But at 18, the pastor of the church started mentoring him further. Even though he had no earthly prospects for proper guidance in his life, who rescued him? Who provided for him? Jesus did. Later, God had blessed him further, getting him to have his own family and a prosperous business. Meaning he didn't leave him as a broken child. That God provided for him, changed, and rescued him. 
And he said, in response to my friend's cry, this is the counselor saying this, Jesus saved him on several levels. So we think about Jesus only saving us for heaven. You know, we sang about and how great thou art. Not only for eternity, this child was saved, but also out of his seemingly impossible circumstances. And it all started with simply crying out, Jesus save me. Jesus save me. Jesus pull me out of the water. I'm drowning. You in denial this morning? Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you, O God, for these challenging words and difficult words from the beginning of the Exodus. The word means name. And you know the name of every child here today. Every one of us, O oh God, have gone through some sort of difficulty. Maybe it stems all the way back to our childhood. And in these moments, O oh God, as adults now, so many years later, you're calling us out of denial, wanting and desire to rescue and to save us. So from the hearts of every child here, that you know them so well, O oh God, can we simply say, Jesus, save me. Can you say that in your heart? Jesus, save me. Because I'm broken. I'm broken from a hurt, Lord, that happened so long ago. I was so small as a child. But I desire, oh God, that you would rescue me. That you would pull me out of that. And restore me. Renew me. Allow your plans that you have for me to succeed out of your light, out of your goodness, out of your love, and out of your mercy. 